let me just say uh, welcome to the Urban Mobilities panel. And uh, today we'll be hearing from uh, Jason Finch and Anisha Ahuja. Ah Ahuja, I hope I didn't butcher your name too badly, um, in a program that will take us from London to India. Uh, unfortunately, our third panelist, uh, Julia Rampola, had to withdraw, uh, which is too bad in a way that would have brought uh, the Chinese city of Shenzhen into the dialogue. And uh, I think there, there are a lot of interesting dialogues to be had here. Uh, but I think we have plenty to work with. So I will uh, dive right in and introduce our first speaker, uh, Jason Finch, uh, who is one of the founding members and former president of Alice, the organization that's brought us here today. Um, and he has published or co-edited quite a few books, uh, the most recent of which is particularly relevant for our purposes. Uh, it's titled Literary Urban Studies and How to Practice It. Uh, and it just came out with Rutledge. Um, and actually, I think I've got a link to that for anyone who is interested. One second. Um, and the uh, his talk for today is related to research he's been doing as part of a funded four country European project called Put Space. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And, and I'll give you the link to that too, in case you're interested, uh, which stands for Public Transport as Public Space in European Cities, Narrating, Experiencing, Contesting. And so his paper today is titled uh, Post-Victorian Tremors, Urban Mobility in Wolf's The Years. Jason. Okay, thanks, Eric. And I'll just share my screen. Can you see that now? So, yeah, I mean, that's my title. And thanks, Eric, for the introduction. I think I could have added peripheral people to the subtitle. So, you know, urban mobility and peripheral people in Wolf's The Years. Um, I'm going to talk off slides rather than read a really finished paper today. So I hope you'll bear with me if there's a bit more umming and ahhing than perhaps there should be, but it's relatively early stage stuff. So that seemed to be the right way to go. Um, so yeah, as Eric also said, this research has emerged from a funded project with the acronym Put Space, Public Transport as Public Space in European Cities, Narrating, Experiencing, Contesting. The idea of this project, which is an interdisciplinary project involving not just literary scholars and historians, but also critical geographers, transport geographers, and sociologists with regional expertise. The idea is to humanize public transport through what we call a more than technological approach. And then we have these planks structuring it, narrating experience and contesting. Um, the aim is not just to have an academic impact, but we hope to get involved with policy and outreach uh, through connections with activists and enthusiast groups. And the research I'm going to show you now, it emerged from trying to talk to people in social sciences and in policy, from policy backgrounds, and try to convince them that there's something different and valuable about source materials from the past, including artistic ones. And by artistic, I mean, you know, anything visual, uh, literary, architectural, etc. So I presented with some of my colleagues on the team who are based here with me in Finland um, at a Putzbase Symposium in Görlitz in Germany last autumn, and this develops from that. And the reason you've got that lovely picture of the Paris Metro is that the way in was through looking at um, what we call modernism and high modernism of the 1910s and how it emerged from cities like London and Paris um, in dialogue with what was going on in transport at the time. So the Paris Metro opened in 1900, you have a station, a Cité station, and then you have uh, Ezra Pound's famous imagist lyric in a station of the Metro. So what would it be if that had a different title? It, it might seem quite different, even though we, we have a crowd mentioned in the poem. Um, so anyway, and there's other work coming up there in Put Space. And what I'm aiming to do uh, is 
intervene in wolf studies, Virginia wolf studies, as well as uh, have something to say about what literary approaches can do in public transport studies. Um, <clears throat> I think that in the existing bibliography on wolf and transport, which is quite fair, um, there's a dominance of what we could call automobilism. Um, so Andrew Thacker in an influential book called Moving Through Modernity from 2003 speaks of the general social revolution of technologies like the motor car. And along with this, in a lot of work in uh, modernist studies, there's an emphasis on acceleration to the idea of technological change speeding up and then this matching with the experience of traveling in vehicles that are going at unprecedented speeds, which people had in cars and airplanes and so on in the early decades of the 20th century. Of course, with Wolf studies, um, gender related approaches have long been very strong, and some of the studies here do that. For example, an interesting study of Forster Wolf and the Alexandria Tramway, which I won't be able to go into, but then that would take us to another setting <clears throat> beyond the, the edge of Europe, really. Um, another time, though. Um, one approach is also to link the way that um, people moved through spaces in cities and the way vehicles moved with the way that narratives move. So perhaps in modernism, this leads to emphasis on um, interruptions and breaks and fragmentarity and so on. Um, in views of wolf and transport, there's often been seen an increased complexity through the literary career. There's often been a focus on uh, a text like Mrs. Dalloway, which is widely taught as an epitome of what we call modernism. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of putting that into inverted commas because I do want to query it uh, a bit further. Um, and also in recent or last few decades of Wolf scholarship, there's been a huge amount of other material of Wolf's writings and biographical evidence and evidence of her circle available, which has often fed into work on the fiction or work on the transport has gone across this line between studying the novels, which perhaps earlier was more central and then studying something much broader than that. In the few studies which have really concentrated on transport, they, they've tended to isolate individual transport modes. So for example, one study of the omnibus in Wolf, and then a chapter which goes into representations of the London Underground in Wolf. Um, now what I'm trying to do in is to seek a new approach to public transport in Wolf. I think that you know, transport representations in Wolf are very, they're actually very important and they've been studied in rather a bitty way. Um, and I propose that we look at it in terms of overlapping mobilities and multiple temporal ranges. And as two kind of theoretical tools or methodological, one <clears throat> would be the so-called new mobilities paradigm, which has emerged, first of all, in the social sciences since about 2005, as a way of reframing social action around mobility, rather than more static um, spatial settings, and which in turn has brought the socio-political edge to transport studies. I mean, transport studies can be very kind of geeky and very, very focused on the details of particular trains or, or you know, funding systems for transport and so on. So it brings in this kind of critical aspect. When it's been um, adapted by humanities scholars and when humanities scholars like um, Charlotte Matheson, Lynn Pierce, Marion Aguiar and others, they've insisted on the need for humanities interventions in mobility studies, they've often brought in matters like individuality and subjectivity, which are classically familiar in literary studies. Um, to critique it, I wonder, you know, is it, it's generally oriented around our contemporary planning problems and therefore liable to dismiss things which are not obviously relevant to what we can see going on right now. And in line with that, I would also like to put alongside it the, the older notion of the long durée uh, presented by the French historian Annals group historian Fernand Brodel in 1958, which is sometimes thought about as being a history that expands over many centuries, but it's also something that Brodel talked about in a shorter range over you know, half a century and up, and also about comparing different time ranges with each other as opposed to simple and sequential periodization. Um, so I've had tremors in my title and you might wonder what kinds of tremors are we talking about? Well, I would say that these tremors include uh, the tremors 
of vehicles in the street, the tremors that people's bodies may make with physical and emotional causes. Um, they may be momentary or they may be some kind of much more long-term effects. Um, transport modes have their own rhythms as scholars of modernism have noticed and as writers in say the 1920s like I.A. Richards noticed, he said that no one at all sensitive to rhythm will doubt that the new pervasive almost ceaseless mutter and roar of modern transport replacing, replacing the rhythm of the footstep or horse's hooves is capable of interfering in many ways with our reading of verse, he said. Um, and when we think about these, these tremors, I, I propose we think about them in terms of comparing shorter and longer temporal spans. So we could think about, you know, Wolf London from the 19 tens to the 1930s in terms of the impact of say the First World War and that's often been done in readings of Mrs. Dalloway but we could also think about I think of kind of longer term I don't know scars or markings that the city might leave on people and on people's interrelationships and we might look at that in the broader imperial context which is as with many English writers of the 19th and early 20th centuries kind of half in sight half out of sight at the periphery of the novel. We may also think with tremors of something like T.S. Eliot's falling towers in the last part of the wasteland, so the imperial city shaking in this period. When we turn to Wolf's The Years, 1937, we find a whole load of people who lurk or impinge on the consciousness of the main characters, both people who are kind of of lower social class positions. I mean, the novel is largely focalized around an upper middle class family in more than one generation over several decades. Um, this is the pargeters, people like workers, beggars, servants, poor children in the city, but also are people who experience social and financial decline in a new century. So in other words, people who are kind of um, overturned, you know, they, they are caught in the stresses and strains of the city in that way. Um, and they're kind of within and without the circle of family circle, which is at the centre of the book. Um, I propose we look at the novel as a Londoner's fiction making. Uh, the Years was Wolf's second to last novel. The main protagonist, although it's also an ensemble novel, is Eleanor Pargeter, who was born in about 1865. If you, you follow the novel's chronology, it begins in 1880 when she's a 15 year old girl. So in other words, she can't be exactly aligned with Wolf herself, uh, seeing as she's at least 15 or 17 years older and if she stays unmarried throughout the book, for example. Alongside the years, I'd also just like to mention Wolf's 1919 novel, Night and Day, although I won't say any more about it really. It's I think her first great London novel, it's, a, it's still an undervalued novel and it has multiple transport networks appearing in it. So I'm gonna be talking about Wolf's fiction and what she did artistically with urban mobilities. And we constantly struggle, I think, to, or we encounter the relationship between this and Wolf, the biographical individual who was a Londoner raised in Kensington. She was in childhood and youth constantly on the move around central London. She very often moved by horse and later motor omnibus as texts like her moments of being charred. Um, but I wonder if we need a different approach to fiction from these various other kinds of prose works. And my focus will be less on automobility, which I think has possibly been you know, overemphasized, more on the relationship between public transport and a multimodality which could be a situation like somebody walking in the street and then entering a bus. Um, and, and I'm interested in the survivals and overlaps of different mobility eras, which the structure of the temporal structure of the years enables Wolf to present. So briefly, the novel is structured into sections which have titles from year numbers. So the first section is called 1880, then there's one called 1891. There are several shorter sections between 1907 and 1918. And then there's a jump over another couple of decades to the last long section, which is just called present day. And um, I think briefly, it's important to think of these sections and as you know, literary titles. So in other words, it's 1914. This isn't straightforwardly 1914. Um, 
But let's go to 1891 when Eleanor Pargister is aged about 25 um, and she boards a yellow bus, uh, a horse-drawn omnibus like this one. And this is in the section called 1891. And quote, at the corner, she stopped and looked anxiously down the road. Among the other traffic, she singled out one bulky form. Mercifully, it was yellow. Mercifully, she had caught her bus. She hailed it and climbed on top. She sighed with relief as she pulled the leather apron over her knees. All responsibility now rested with the driver. She relaxed. She breathed in the soft London air. She heard the dull London roar with pleasure. Um, and then she goes to a meeting. This is a kind of charity meeting. Um, she's on the board of a, a committee of a charity. And then she runs out of the meeting. So she's late for the bus to get to the meeting. And then she's kind of in a rush coming back to her house where she's still supposed to have lunch with her elderly widowed father. And this is the return. She dashed into the road, waving her hand among the carts and horses. The conductor saw her, curved his arm around her and hauled her up. She had caught her bus. She trod on the toe of a man in the corner and pitched down between two elderly women. So the points I would emphasize there are there's hurry. There's also an idea, however, perhaps less obvious, of kind of seizing the bus, of taking control of it. She had caught her bus. It's almost like a kind of hunting. And so she's able to be almost predatory when she does this. And yet there's this gendered role on the bus. This is before, um, in my title slide showed a woman bus conductor from 1916 or so. This was before there were any London women bus conductors. That only happened during the First World War. So the conductor is male. He, he kind of acts as this protector who brings her onto the bus. Then she treads on the toe of a man. The man turns out to be of a lower social class and we get a kind of brief view from his side of how Eleanor looks to him. Um, so that's 1891. You see this beautiful um, restored yellow horse-drawn bus. Now, Virginia Woolf famously said in her essay, Mr. Bennett and Mr. Mrs. Brown, that on or about December 1910, human character changed. So I was intrigued to find out that the motor bus also entered London in October 1910, so very close in time to that, and the last horse bus ran in 1911. So you have almost this modernity being established that way. Um, on the left here, you have a still from a 1917 documentary film showing a 1910 LGOC B type bus running between Shepherd's Bush and Liverpool Street, which means going through central London from west of it through to the east. And in a way, I'd like to use these images to reflect on the use of visual sources when we look at something like public transport or outmoded technologies that they kind of need visualization. It's not necessarily obvious to us because we don't see them every day. Um, so here we have a glossy museum vehicle, restored vehicle. Here we have a shot from the time. It's also a still from a documentary film. Um, and if you look at a still, another one from the same documentary film, like you can see on screen now, you can see an open top decked bus as all London double decker buses were at the time. Something similar is written by the characters Catherine Hilbury and uh, Ralph Denham in Wolf's Night and Day as a cross-class couple who kind of get exhilarating rides through central London that way. But if we look at that photo, we might see it in the terms of, say, a silent movie because it's black and white, because we see these dark clad figures, we might imagine them dashing around. But yet it's not like that when you read Wolf. I mean, you, you, you meet it together with colours and you meet it together with the seasons and you meet it together with sounds. Um, so I, I'm just asking that we foreground our disciplinary perspectives when we juxtapose uh, image and text, really. Um, but moving on in the novel, uh, a section which is set in 1914 in, in fact, the spring of 1914, just before the outbreak of the First World War, contains two characters now middle aged from the same generation as Eleanor traveling on a motor bus. Um, and if I just read the bold section, the highlighted section, basically they're traveling back from lunch near St Paul's Cathedral to Hyde Park, which is in the more fashionable West End of London. Um, and at Charing Cross Station, looking for another bus, they see a beggar selling violets. She had no nose. Her face was seamed with white patches. There were red rims for nostrils. She had no nose. She had pulled her hat down to hide that fact. And you also get in the same passage here, 
similar kinds of relationship to um, you know the, the the action but also the distraction of the bus and its surroundings and related gendered roles um, the final section of the book is called just present day um, which yeah invites the question of exactly when it is um, there's the photograph on the left here which shows a horse-drawn coal cart in Chelsea in London in 1910. The section present day is set about 25 years after this photograph was taken so it's like a full generation afterwards and in it one of the younger targeters drives Eleanor now aged about 70 through a London of many cars but within it a horse-drawn commercial traffic survives. So quote, the street was blocked with vans, he hooted, he stopped. He hooted again. A man went to the horse's head, for it was a coal cart, and the horse slowly plodded on. Now, I suggest that we need to resist these oversimplifying shifts between transport modes that seem to match aesthetic change, and that looking at this transport history alongside the urban mobilities of the novel and the character relationships within it, major minor character relationships in particular, it might make us question our sort of aesthetic. Um, temporal categories, which we, we still often work with. And now, so from now on, the last couple of minutes, um, I would just give some kind of overall observations and a bit of summing up based on that. Um, so in terms of thinking about public transport as public space, the objective of the project, I think it's important to consider how earlier eras modes live on. So the coal cart and for instance, working class children who are invited to an upper middle class party and then fed cake and then observe the targeters and their friends in the last section of the book are alike disruptive presences in that section present day. And we be, should be wary you know, if we think we're doing modernism that we need to seek transport appropriate to that which is the fastest, the most exhilarating, etc. For instance, the horse-drawn coal cart in London survived until the 1970s, if not later. So, you know, we have these persistences and recurrences of previous eras um, here, the Victorian, even the pre-Victorian. And from you know, personal memories, I can remember being a small child and the London Underground and one line which had the oldest carriages, which were, I think, actually from before the Second World War at the time. So it, 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 how it feels like you are entering another age when you do that. Um, there's a further step here. I think we could look further at the trams, the tramway in Wolf, which has been more or less completely neglected. So here there are sounds like bells. Here there are also connections with neighbourhoods in London. When you hear a tram, you know that you're entering a kind of bustling working class neighbourhood. So could that be a disruptive network? Um, and I suggest looking at Wolf studies that long durée view of urban mobilities could help. And we could call this doing the buses in different voices. Wolf, perhaps obviously, is not just someone trying to convey her own experiences as a biographical or biological individual, but the fictions like The Years, they really do offer such a reading as a bait. They kind of invite that kind of reading. Instead, perhaps let's think further about the ventriloquism of fiction. So motifs like um, the phrase, he do the police in different voices, which uh, T.S. Eliot took from Dickens's Bleak House for an early title of The Wasteland. Um, likewise, Wolf in the Years, a ventriloquism of, say, male characters, say, servants that could bear investigation together with these transport networks. So the novel is not history, of course, but The Years is a playful invitation to treat it as such. And we, we have to look at the play there, I think. And, and again, we need to also think inside and outside otherness. So we both get subjectivity of characters who are outside the social range of the targeters, like Crosby, their, their former servant, a woman who retires, and then we enter her interior life. On the other hand, the people glimpsed momentarily, the, the man whose toe is trodden on the beggar selling violets from the examples that the coal cart driver that I already gave you. Um, so the city finally is both nourishing and debilitating and the years leaves us with 
really very little clue to its future in that world. Of course, you know, Wolf would die not long afterwards, the Second World War would break out. The very last sentence of the novel is the sun had risen and the sky above the houses wore an air of extraordinary beauty, simplicity and peace. Um, thinking about these tremors of my title, the years is full of marginal people who call for character analysis, for example, on the model of uh, my minor and major characters proposed by Alex Wallach, and it's full of temporal non-linearities, overlaps, pauses, gaps. Together, these bring a kind of haunting quality to superficially a peaceful and orderly urban space with persistent suggestions of otherness and incursions. So it's a quality of the Gothic or fantastic, as has been said about Virginia Woolf by an earlier scholar and as Patricia Garcia has recently written about the literature of the fantastic in 19th century London. Um, I think it does relate to the resistance, resilience and renewal question from the conference title, but in a bit of a, a knotty way. I mean, I've long been fascinated by the way that you know, London kind of sits on other places in the imperial era, yet it has its huge kind of manifold of people who are like damaged or, you know, and yet where are they? Are they at the metropolitan center? Are they peripheral? It's very, very hard to say. And I'd argue that transport networks together with the novel's peripheral people convey the strains, the wear and tear, the trauma, the shaking, enduring, the disappearing alike easily forgotten in their individuality. So, yeah, I mean, this, this points to ways of talking about literary London as you know, having a complex character. But finally, the status of the city in Wolf is, is utterly in question and its future is unknowable, as is whose it is and who it belongs to. Um, so I think I'll bring it to a stop there. And thanks for listening. Sorry, I, I was muted there. Um, Jason, thanks very much. Uh, really interesting. Lots to talk about many questions, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll hold our questions uh, for the end of the session. Um, and so I will move on and introduce our next speaker, uh, who is Anisha Aouja, and she is a PhD student at Claremont Graduate University uh, with an emphasis in women's and gender studies. And her research interests include post-colonial studies, feminist studies, and queer theory with a focus on South Asia. And her paper today is titled the Shramik Special, COVID-19, Migrant Relief Trains in Lockdown, India, and Geographies of Domination. Anisha. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. And thank you, Jason. That was excellent. And I do see a lot of uh, connections between our papers. So I'm interested to get into the conversation. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen. So everyone can see, great. Uh, so uh, Eric already introduced me, but my name is Anisha. I am a PhD student <clears throat> in cultural studies and women's studies at Claremont Graduate University here in Southern California. Um, I'm presenting my paper today, the Shramik Special COVID-19 Migrant Relief Trains in Lockdown India and Geographies of Domination. Um, I started working on this paper about a year ago, I'm working on developing um, a kind of journal article, so I'm interested in hearing uh, your feedback. And uh, by the time I wrote this paper, of course, a lot of events have occurred in the span, which I'll address at the end, but I'm really focusing on this one kind of moment um, in the summer of 2020. And um, so this presentation, in terms of the visuals that you'll see, it's really less of any type of kind of um, textual part of my presentation, but really just new, a collection of news and media headlines that um, I've collected from the time span of March, 2020 um, to, towards uh, April, 2021. So really just to give you kind of a, a visual landscape and understanding of how a lot of people came into political consciousness in terms of the issues um, of COVID-19 in India, but very specific to these migrant relief trains. Um, so with that being said, there aren't really any images here on the presentation. Um, that's not really something I'm interested in showing, but my presentation does cover a lot of the experiences of the pandemic, um, deaths of many people in India. So in that sense, that's just a content warning for what I'm going to be 
speaking about. So I will be reading a portion of my paper, so a little bit different than Jason. Um, so any feedback you have would be great. On May 1st, 2020, the Indian Ministry of Railways and the Ministry of Home Affairs under Prime Minister Narendra Modi's oversight implemented special migrant relief trains called Shramik Specials to assist in the catastrophic migrant crisis caused by Modi's lockdown on March 25th, 2020. The sudden and disorganized lockdown completely halted the economy, giving four hours notice to citizens to stay inside for three weeks. Migrant workers who hold jobs like mechanics, drivers, and cleaners represent the lowest rung of the Indian social and political class and caste system. The March lockdown forced 10 million workers to walk and bike all the way home, over 100 dying in road and train accidents or from hunger and exhaustion. In response to these conditions of the exodus, Modi's government provided emergency relief trains called the Shramik Specials. They were intended to be a humanitarian act intended to ferry workers with special ticket prices, social distancing rules, and food and water provisions. National and international headlines spotlighted that the special trains uh, were delayed, leaving migrants to wait in scorching weather for multiple days with shortages of food and water, and that dozens of trains did not make it at all. Workers and families died on trains, on the tracks, the stations, in line due to heat and exhaustion and from lack of food and water. There was no semblance of social distancing possible in the seating areas or the aisles and bodies were pulled from carriages and covered with sheets on the station platform. In one instance, captured by a video that streamed virally on social media platforms, a young child lifts and moves around a sheet that was covering their deceased mother on the platform who had died because of the conditions of the journey. The ways interlocking systems of power, caste and class, gender and sexuality materialize in the geography of the train comes to embody a space of subalternity and its production under capitalism in urban and rural space in India. Migrant workers in India are a community made up of the most systematically disenfranchised populations, many times referred to as Baojan, who are members of the lowest caste and indigenous peoples. They face heightened discrimination under the fascist Hindu nationalist government. Economic refugees and workers from deeply impoverished rural areas travel to urban centers like Maharashtra and Delhi and participate in and produce what Arjuna Padurai calls shadow economies. The moving relief train is a site of what Catherine McKittrick calls geographies of domination that interact with embodied experiences of how low caste and subaltern communities. How does the space of the train and its components encapsulate the subjugation that spreads across the train of India, produces abjectness and racial sexual subjection and reaches its culmination in the intersection of a global public health crisis? On May 27, 2020, a video shared virally on social media platforms portrayed a scene in which a young child lifts and moves around a sheet covering their deceased mother. This video was taken at a station in Muzavarpur in the northeastern state of Bihar, where she had arrived from Ahmedabad, Gujarat, one of the main travel routes of the Shramik special. She, 23 years old or 35 years old, depending on the source, Arbina Khatun and her family were including, uh, which included her sister, brother-in-law, and two children, were traveling to Katihar, a city in Bihar, that was another 200 miles from Muzaffarpur. Her family stated that she had been unwell on the train due to the shortage of food and water. She had boarded the train from Gujarat on Saturday and collapsed shortly before arriving in Muzaffarpur on that Monday. The video depicts a young barefoot two-year-old child lifting and moving around a blue, gray, and brown striped shroud that had been placed to cover her body on the platform. The video is 14 seconds long and circulated news media on Twitter. The person filming is standing on the platform close enough to capture the color of the blanket, the stiffness of her posture, the small child, and another slightly bigger child walking past with a water bottle. The woman has material acting as a cushion underneath her, leading the viewer to believe she may have been carried off of the train and placed on the platform like what happened for many others. 
Her family states that she died from hunger and dehydration on the train, while the local police claimed it to be of illness. Her family demanded the release of her actual cause of death. The train as a physical and material entity is more than just a stable and unchanging body of transport. It, to quote McKittrick, is a site of violent subjection that reveals rather than conceals. The train express expresses the becoming of death worlds created by the nation state and economy where populations are conferred to the status of living dead. This draws from Achille Mbembe's necropolitics. My paper also refer refers to Warren Montag's uh, expansion of necropolitics into necroeconomics when there exists a state of exception where death sustains the life of the market. Both necro necropolitics and necroeconomics ground thinking about the relief train. This project is a theoretical inquiry into the geographies of sub subjection that structure India's landscape as a space charged with caste and class oppression. It will draw between the work of South Asian historiographers with and Black Atlantic scholars to rethink the Shramic special through the framework of the necro, the ship, <clears throat> and the oceanic to reconsider the urban and rural landscapes that are dictated by extreme levels of displacement and deprivation. Black Atlantic scholar Paul Gilroy introduces the ship as a chronotope in reference to Mikhail Bakhtin's concept defined as a unit of analysis for studying texts according to the ratio and nature of the temporal and spatial categories represented. The chronotope is an optic for reading texts as x-rays of the forces at work in the culture system from which they spring." Unquote. The migrant relief train as chronotope acts as an x-ray into the socio-political conditions that revealed themselves more visibly in the conditions of COVID-19 and the lockdown. This draws from Gilroy's slave ship in motion as a material living microcultural micropolitical system, a micropolitical system that helps to rethink modernity and conditions of humanity. So in pre-independence Indian history, the ship figures as a transporter of convicts or political prisoners turned laborers. Claire Anderson explains how the ship was, quote, an unfamiliar technological space in which their sense of cultural and geographical displacement began, unquote. The journey itself was a form of punishment across what they called the Black Water or Kalapani. The Prison Discipline Committee saw transportation to be a weapon and source of tremendous power. Men of all castes, classes, and religions were chained together, sharing water from dirty drinking vessels and banned from proper religious ceremonies upon the death of many others. This is a common anti-Muslim practice as well that's practiced under the BJP regime today. And physical and psychological conditions on board led to the spread of disease. While new rules were set up to regulate the conditions, they were not implemented and many died upon arrival at the penal colonies. In the case of the transatlantic slave ship, Christina Sharp articulates that, quote, the hold that sutures modernity is the slave ship hold, is the hold of the so-called called migrant ship, is the prison, is the womb that produces blackness. While the shamic special is land-based transportation, the convict ship and the slave ship and the literature surrounding it are a way to conceptualize the uprooting of migrants and low caste individuals across disconnected swaths of space. Treating the shamic special through the black Atlantic theorization of the slave ship becomes a fecund site to analyze the ongoing and sensory production of migrancy and caste in India. The train can be conceptualized through Sharp's language of the ship as a lateral space of relations, the ship, the hold, the wake, the weather, the overboard, as well as a space of enterprise and containerization, property, insurance, resistance, and a material and symbolic articulation of life, death, and the liquid grave. I will describe the train in its lateral relations from its industrial components to the atmosphere to its contents. The necro space of the shamanic special is the train coach station platforms, the ticket counter, the carriages, the seats and bedding, the rationings and the train tracks themselves. The weather and atmosphere, the heat, the smell, the air, the taste, the shortage of food, water, air resources, and the excess of bodies, flesh, and bodily bodiliness. 
these entities together and how they are occupied and experienced make up the conditions of and define the site as a necropolitical and necroeconomic space of domination. Through these contributions of Black Atlantic scholarship, we can envision the, out, the train as a holistic and embodied environment of relations involved in the production of subjection. Horton Spillers describes the crossing of the Middle Passage as a suspension in the oceanic, where, quote, these captive persons without names that their captors would recognize were in movement across the Atlantic, but they were also nowhere at all. The Shramic special occupies an oceanic in between urban rural space whose divisions are concretized under conditions of modernity and the production of surplus populations. The story of this boy and his mother potentially illustrate the paradox between migrant workers who are dictated in geography, but simultaneously ungeographic or nowhere at all. Arbina Katun, defined as migrant, was not yet to her destination, and it's unclear if she had the possibility of making it to that endpoint. On the same train as Abina Katun, nine migrants, including a two-year-old, died within three days. In Sharp's text in the wake, the wake of a ship is defined as, quote, the track left on the water surface by a ship, the disturbance caused by a body swimming or moved in water. Arbina Katun and others' deaths caused a type of disturbance and discontinuity of the effort of the movement of the train. While the railway system seems systematic and disembodied, the wake of the train or the reverberation and aftermath of Katun's death is where the migrant train continuously reproduces subalternity and the death world is made visible. The movement of her body onto the platform and the attempt by the boy to wake her up challenges the universality of this government relief effort as life and death excessively flow through the train's moving carriages to the platforms intended for departures home. So we can think about the wig as something spatial, temporal, an opening into how populations are made beyond the transport vehicle, the way they're connected to the motor and the way they're left behind in the same vein. So the wake is specifically that opening into the making of the death worlds and the way that the life of modernity and the market um, is necessary in the expulsion of the migrants. The Shramic specials differentiated themselves in the pandemic era relief trains developed through the specific accelerated spread of an airborne virus. They were intended to obey social distancing rules, provide basic resources of food and water, make long rides with few stops and offer entry with low price tickets and COVID screenings. Through 4,000, though 4,700 trains ran in the months through May to August, the trains were over capacity. The ticket counter and physical ticket continued to articulate how the Shramic relief train was linked to quote unquote humanely discounted tickets. Still passengers waited in line for tickets to be charged four times their daily wage. So at the ticket counter in the line, the discounted ticket, only some have access to modes of life and mobility. The train can be reconceptualized as a type of cold, hard overboard where bodies are discarded and subalternity is continuously being produced. In the video, Katoon's back lay straight on the platform. In one other case, as reported by Al Jazeera, a four-year-old boy died on the trip along with two others who had to be pulled from the carriages onto the platform, culminating in a total of 15 workers who died in the month of May in 2020. The deceased migrants were carried and placed on the platform or covered and left alone. While seem seemingly external, the platform acts as an extension of the train, which is dialectically a migrant relief train and a moving shuffling grave. The train is a space where life and death intertwine. Patoon also here experiences a hypergendering as a woman mother on the overboard, an emerging and unmarked grave. So the train is not a static entity, but rather something that is constantly being created as the conditions of racial, sexual, economic subjugation emerge inside and outside of it. Spillers dis distinguishes between flesh and body as the distinction between the captive and liberated subject positions. Bodies, flesh, particularly an excess of bodiliness, 
compose conditions that elucidate how workers are in constant states of precarity and displacement. The Indian subalterns are overdetermined by their bodies and excess, hypervisible in the stage of the train, where flesh and the conditions of the environment um, manage what the COVID relief train is at all. The train as a space of living death is experienced through instances of starvation, dehydration, exhaustion, or heat exposure. The area of the relief train is encompassed by its atmosphere, the air that people share, the scorching heat over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, made worse by the amount of people in one space. The train becomes a space of exhaustion and shortage. The climate encompasses the exchange of breath and olfactory circulation, the platform fills with sweat and the interactions based on sharing resources with one another. The climate is one of a shared atmosphere that embodies the production of subalternity and experiences under capitalism that limit access to even the mundaneness of comfort. Spatially, temporally, and environmentally, there is a shortage in what could sustain life. In the spring of 2021, the Delta variant led to hundreds of thousands of deaths, about 300,000 reported, yet many guessing that the number was manufactured by the Modi regime and was potentially more in the millions. In May and April of 2021, during the height of the deadly COVID surge, the lack of supplies demanded the need to help people elsewhere and sparked the creation of something new, the Oxygen Express train and the COVID care coach. How does a space that delivered so much death transport and give literal life? What type of stratifying and haunting is mobilized in the genre of the COVID-19 train? The Shramik special in its own macro-oceanic movement only ran for a few months, but produced subjectivities around its many dimensions, the platform, the ticketing, the seats and aisles, the bathroom, milk, heat and sweat, bed sheets, video cameras, graves, not only can the migrant relief train reveal the hardships of Indian communities, but it becomes a site to understand the mechanisms of flesh and the necro that produce subalternity in the first place. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha. Very interesting stuff. Um, well, I uh, definitely have questions of my own, but I think uh, I should take a back seat and. Uh, and uh, uh, get questions from audience members. So uh, are there any questions? Uh, you can uh, the, the, use the raise hand function, which is under the reactions uh, button on your, on your uh, navigation bar, um, or use chat if, if that feels more comfortable. Any questions? Well, maybe I will get the ball rolling with my own questions then. Um, and well, let me start with one for Anisha. Um, so I was I was really interested that you use kind of thinkers of the Atlantic slave trade uh, and uh, um, to 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 think through um, you know the imagery uh, surrounding this and the reality surrounding these these trains. Um, and, and I get the value and interest of doing that. Um, and, and I see the, uh, the link, uh, and, but I also think it's important to think about uh, differences. And, um, and so one question I had is, is you know, in the, in the case of the Middle Passage, we have forced migration. And here, unless I misunderstood, the problem is, is uh, a, a problem of excess demand for that transportation, right? The, the pull of labor uh, opportunities, um, and so how do you how do you deal with that uh, difference in in your work? Yeah, um, that's definitely you know I'm obviously building some you know cautious affinities here, but I I do really think that the work um, of the Black Atlantic scholars and kind of how they're conceptualizing geography and embodiment. Um, in the these spaces is useful, um, you know, especially in terms of how you know in these original uh, ships that constituted you know forced migration and in Indian history kind of also occurred over this kind of black water that they discussed. Um, in terms of some differences, so 
you know, it is interesting because with lockdown, there was this expulsion and it, um, you know, it was kind of a, a forced exodus. So it was a little different, of course, than a forced migration. Um, but it was, uh, you know, um, kind of this mass exodus. And so that's interesting that you say that, you know, and thinking about it, because the trains were something that people were needing to opt into, and then there was an overcapacity. So I definitely, you know, do want to keep in mind that there are these differences, and really with the Black Atlantic scholars to kind of stick to the tools that they're offering as scholars, right? Um, another difference was kind of the way that gender took a play. So that's something that I kind of go into more in the full length of the paper. But, you know, Horton Spillers talks about how in the space of the ship, the homogenization, people become ungendered. Um, and I think that this becomes sign of an opposite situation. I think people are, you know, being hyper gendered over kind of determined by, by their conditions of gender. You can see that in this video that I've kind of used to anchor the piece about, you know, this, this woman, this mother that was continuously kind of being presented as this, this mother, even more so than the fact that she was the, this migrant worker, right? Um, and, you know, other kind of terms of differences are, of course, that this is, you know, locomotive transportation on ground. So the overboard, you know, is this kind of static, cold, hard platform, especially in terms of thinking about it in this like kind of sensory way. Um, so as I kind of worked through it more, you know, it allowed for really teasing out in very interesting ways, those those differences in terms of the transportation and having kind of the basic groundwork of, you know, here is this, uh, you know, enclosed space that also is very excessive that can act as this type of chronotope really into, um, you know, how, you know, geography is embodied. It is not this kind of static thing that, you know, um, things are being made as it's, as it's being, um, you know, transporting folks. And I think specifically the last thing I'll say is that with the migrant relief train, right, this, there is this kind of interesting dualism happening where it's supposed to provide relief, it's moving migrants, you know, um, but at the same time, it's kind of, you know, dropping them in, in random places. And there's really this, this lack of a destination for many. And, you know, it's kind of just this, uh, you know, really paradoxical, situation in terms of the specific COVID era relief train and actually, you know, the kind of envisioning of the realities of uh, an exodus of people who came to these urban centers with like nothing and were basically carrying all of their belongings on the way home. So yeah, I definitely, you know, I've been working through this project um, for a while, you know, it's definitely an interesting take that I'm taking on it. So I, I'm interested in any feedback, but I really want to make those connections between how Indian historiographers are conceptualizing movement of migrants and of workers, and as well as kind of what Black Atlantic scholars have discussed in terms of these like enclosed yet excessive spaces. So I hope that answers it a little bit, but I'll definitely take note of your question. Well, it, it's it, there's a lot of ground to cover, but yeah, it's, it's that space itself that of of the the mode of transport that's that's interesting to you, and I, I think there's some overlap with with Jason's talk there too. Um, and, but let let me throw it out to the audience again and see if, uh, if if any other questions have arisen in the meantime. And if people are still thinking, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, oh, uh, Lisa, please. Just sort of in between a question and an observation sparked by Jason's talk. Um, when you, you, when you flashed the quote from um, Wolf, um, she had caught her bus. I had a physical response, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, and, um, and, you know, as you point out, you know, it's no longer a yellow omnibus I'm trying to catch wherever. It's, sometimes it's just spotting my Uber in the crowd, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that, there's just that sort of moment of um, incredible excitement and relief when you have got your, your um, the, whatever mode of transport it is, it's going to take you from one part of the city to the other. How, how, and how that has endured that moment of kind of anxiety yeah. and excitement uh, and relief. Um, still endures, you know, despite the conveyance itself. I was just, I was just really struck with that. 
No, I mean, I think it's one of the things that drew me to Wolf when looking at public transport as public space, that these kind of transport moments often have exactly that kind of in intensity, that kind of uncertainty. And she also, of course, foregrounds these kind of encounters which are not encounters, you know, that you, you are in proximity with strangers and you, there's a great deal of uncertainty in, you know, who they are and who you are, and, and yet there you are. Um, and that goes alongside exactly that question of, you know, temporality and finding your Uber or finding your horse-drawn omnibus or whatever. Um, and, and also the way, in, in all of those conveyances, the way we create a kind of bubble of, mm -hmm. um, and sort of insulate ourselves even in, in among the crowd. Yeah, it was really evocative. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Even if we don't have a leather apron to put exactly. over our leather legs. Exactly, apron. But I never knew about, but I suppose it was because there were all these kind of smuts and things in the air. But, yeah. anyway. Flying bits of coal or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions or, or, or remarks? Uh, if not, let, let me, uh, Jason, uh, throw out to you a question that occurred to me uh, as I was listening. Um, uh, you know, really interested in this project of humanizing public transport. And you mentioned that that interesting scene where she steps on someone's toe uh, mm -hmm. in, in the bus, I believe. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and that person is of an inferior social class. And that got me thinking about social mixing in, in public transport and, um, and, and specifically how that has changed over time you know, with the with the advent of the underground, um, and then later, and maybe especially with the advent of the automobile. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I guess the basic question would be: How much uh, social mixing is there, and uh, th does that change? Uh, you know, uh, in, in ways that you've been able to observe. And and, and before kind of let, giving you a chance to answer. Um, I'd also have the same question for uh, Anisha, you know, because I, I get the sense there's, there's not a lot of social mixing on the SRAM mix uh, special, but, um, you know, I, uh, I'd be interested in knowing if maybe in, in less arduous circumstances there is more or, or not, and, or if this is something you've been able to study. So, so Jason. Um, I mean, social mixing is foregrounded in writing about kind of public transport as in mass transit from the first moments of it which you could say are in the first half of the 19th century um but very often the omnibus of the mid 19th century is still from the kind of upper working class upwards so it's relatively um well it doesn't include probably the majority of the people in the city because it's still so much a city of pedestrianism. So I guess one answer to that is that it's it's really interesting to look at the street and pedestrianism alongside the public transport vehicle and the encounters which are had there, which are kind of more enclosed. And because there's always this kind of threat in public transport of um, being in the proximity of somebody who is who is dangerous to you, whether it's a kind of physical assault or a, a theft or some sort of other interference with you just by being too close to you. So there, there's that kind of possibility of being trapped which is always there in a public transport vehicle um, and you know yet at the same time each of them is kind of classed in different ways and even in, in the period that Wolf's talking about one of the reasons she she hardly ever talks about the trams of London is because basically they went between working class areas and the edge of the city centre or they took people from working class areas of housing to industrial areas where they went to work so I actually would like to know whether she ever ever rode on one but I know that you know as she was growing up she was growing up using the omnibus but also because it was a sort of you know defended space because you had this figure of the conductor and so on um so I, I think it's a really you know important question and it's it's one which we face all the way through um and I, I think that this this in a way, the way that you get a sense of a citizenry is, is equally important here, so that you, you are in, in proximity with people who form your idea of the city overall. And yet, in a way, you are you know, deceiving yourself because it is kind of um, ableist, for instance, the 19th century omnibus, and you have to be you know, fit to leap on and off it, for one thing. 
um, because it's discriminating in terms of fares and so on. Um, so you might also get an idea of the citizenry and of the city, which is, is profoundly misleading, I think. And then, of course, going on to the automobile, I mean, that's, yeah, in a way, another story, but I mean, it is that story precisely of perfect isolation in your own bubble, um, as opposed to compulsory mixing. Yeah, maybe yeah. Anisha, you have thoughts. Um, Eric, were you going to say something? Uh, I, I was just going to ask if you had any thoughts on 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 that question, um, but I, I think I heard another voice or, or question too, and I, I see Liam's hand is up. Um, but but did, did any thoughts occur on the question of social mixing, Anisha? Um, yeah, and um, definitely interesting to expand more upon. I think the that would start even you know at what prompted the creation of the train, which is that moment of exodus and you know, India like is obviously known for these massive heterogeneous populations. So even within these kind of lower working class, they're incredibly stratified. So, I mean, there's, there's a huge group of people that probably, you know, that made it home safely. They have cars, you know, they're, they're able to travel. Um, but, and then even within there's different castes and Dalits are one of the, the lowest caste and something, again, I kind of didn't put in the presentation, but they, you know, were sprayed down with, you know, by sanitation, they were like put in these kind of facilities. Um, and then within the train, I'm sure that there were either people who, you know, had their family supporting them who didn't people who could afford the tickets, um, and be able to go people who helped others or people who kind of, you know, were, uh, you know, nervous about that abjectness that really does spread around these, um, you know, populations. So, um, but it is also interesting that, you know, with the mass amount of migrants, they were homogenized in like the way we absorb them in the media. But there definitely were, you know, were stratifications and people who were able to make it home, who were able to get oxygen later, who were able to, you know, get care for COVID. And then people who either, you know, ended up on this platform and weren't able to get death certificates or, you know, any type of understanding of what happened. So I think that's definitely, you know, and that's another thing that makes it very unique from the other scholarship that I'm using, that there is this kind of, um, you know, that's kind of, again, how these death worlds are created and that even within the space, certain people are able to make it home and others aren't, you know. Thank you. Um, I see that Liam has a question. Um. Uh, yeah, uh, just following up on the, it's, it's actually just from my own position of ignorance, in terms of London public transport, was was transport publicly run at the time? Because I'm more familiar with Dublin, and in Dublin, the trams in the late 19th century and early 20th century were private, so they occupy this kind of odd sort of um, uh, position where they're they're both public and private, well, they're, they're private things. And, uh, and they also seem to offer the possibility of a kind of um, social mixing. And, and you get these sort of encounters with, say, in, in Joyce, you get these moments where, you know, either clergyman or uh, in one of his stories, uh, just a gentleman encounters a, a poorer woman. And, and th there's this sort of social mixing is all going on. But there's also a, a, an ongoing uh controversy about the exclusionary practices of the tram companies that they both build their trams their tram lines in ways that sort of um navigate around poorer neighborhoods and don't go through them and uh, and also that the fares were kind of exclusionary and um so that it's uh, on the one hand it's a kind of uh it, it's a public or social um you know a thing and and it, uh, but on the other hand it, it sort of reinforces or perpetuates social inequalities i wasn't sure if that operates the same way in london was it was it run by municipal authorities or was it a private uh, operation i really wasn't sure yeah it's a great question i mean dublin was fairly unusual among cities of britain and ireland in that i think in it didn't have like a municipal tramway i mean in most most of the cities in fact like more than a hundred cities of Britain and Ireland 
there was an electric tramway built basically by the municipality in the first decades of the 20th century. And it was linked to power generation, which was also centrally owned, basically. Um, I mean, in London, the origins of the transport network were in sort of cutthroat business competition in the 19th century and the equivalent of perhaps, well, I, I don't know, Uber or something, because you also had this kind of, um, you know, capital funding for certain transport ventures, some of which succeeded, some of which didn't. Um, and the, the buses, I mean, the LGOC was a private company, but they're also in Wolf several times, particularly after the First World War, you get the appearance of like a bus that's called a pirate. And there were like returning servicemen who clubbed together and bought a bus or they even used a bus that had been driven out. They were driven out to the Western Front to take kind of troops there and back again. And then they, they kind of operated this around London in a very sort of, you know, this seems like a very Wild West way or something like that in, in the, the years just after the First World War. But basically the... Uh, networks were consolidated in the in the Great Depression period and the London Underground basically bought the bus companies and eventually got control of the London County Council tramways and there was a long struggle between you know, the LCC which was a relatively sort of progressive dominated municipal body and they operated this enormous tram network I mean in 1925 I think the LCC tramways carried more people than any other public net transport network on earth and it was the working class form of transport par excellence in London was, was the tram. Uh, it was the cheapest and you could go a long way on it. Um, but basically they, they sort of lost this battle with the underground, which was essentially a sort of middle class form of public transport. And then they were all sort of nationalized together and grouped together in 1933 in this, this consolidation, which is the, that's when you know, what, what became London Underground and then Transport for London was, was essentially formed then. Um, but the origins are totally in sort of cutthroat competition. And, and even with the tramways, there were the LCC tramways and there were various private tramways serving suburban areas, which were much more like the ones that you described in Dublin in that they would go to places where you know middle class commuters like Clark class people lived and they would avoid sort of working class districts whereas the LCC saw it as their role in the kind of quasi-socialist way like building public housing to provide you know tramways to all of these working class suburbs and in enabling their growth. Um, so it's something that you know, I've got really fascinated by and that I really, I don't know, you get this literary over-representation of metropolises, of course, and places like London, Paris, and then in the sort of next level, Dublin are like far more likely to appear in literary depictions than, than sort of tertiary cities or something like that. But this, this precision, I think is really important to, to get a grip on, I, I think, but yeah, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Since we only had two papers, we have a little extra time. Um, of course, that could be translated into a little extra time for lunch, but uh, <laughs> Jason, were, were you going to? Well, if there's a moment, I mean, I was really <laughs> interested. Uh, is that Eric, sir? Yes. Yeah, Anisha, to know if there's kind of information about kind of the experience of being on the train that people have narrated themselves. I mean, I don't know, maybe I missed it, but I saw the, the sort of journalistic accounts of what was going on here and the facts and figures, like how many trains India Railways made available or something. But are there also accounts of being on the train that have, have come to light? Um, you know, that would be something I should go would have to go back into I think those accounts were like thing kind of like this video right that was mm, you know being yeah. posted like people I think um I think people were you know I was just kind of trying to follow these types of like hashtags and people were kind of talking about you know how expensive tickets were how you know they weren't able to get on um in terms of any type of you know official media you know I don't think there is that deep connection and I think there was you know, in terms of just, you know, how, again, like stratification of class. So I think it was a lot that was, you know, coming onto Twitter of people, 
you know, taking pictures or, you know, taking these videos. Um, but a lot, you know, where people talking about like the prices and um, how difficult it was to get on. That was what I re remember from kind of drawing upon on that end. Um, and yeah, you know, another thing is that, you know, they were all traveling to like their home rural areas and that also intensified the spread of COVID. So that was kind of, you know, other information that was that was coming about. And I think there were um, there were people who once they had made it home who, you know, have been interviewed, who have talked about, you know, like bring, you know, not bringing it, but, <laughs> you know, the spread of COVID that that came home and its impact it had on their families and communities. So those types of um, stories have have come out. I think it's something to kind of, you know, mine for within the, the media. Yeah, and something about the way the nature of how these narratives are formed. I mean, you, you said about following hashtags, like how, how they are being formed. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it might be too soon for kind of full scale um, memoirs or whatever, but uh, I'll bet there's some interesting ones forthcoming. And Anisha might have provided the title for it. <laughs> the, the Shramik special would make a great uh, novel title. Um, anything else before we break for lunch. All right, well, thank you to, to both of our presenters. Uh, thank you all for coming and um, very much hope to see you at noon for the keynote by Carolyn Levine. Thank you.